Our next speaker is Dr. Piotr Mędrzycki from Poland, who works at the Council for Agriculture Research and Agriculture Economy uh, in Bologna in Italy, so Poland but Italy. He coordinates the research group on eco-toxicology, mainly studying the effects of pesticides on bees, which include lethal and sublethal effects of pesticides, multifactorial analysis of uh, bee colony losses, development of new methods for testing toxicity of chemicals to bees, the use of uh, honeybees in monitoring of urban industrial agriculture and military pollution. He also studies biodiversity of wild pollinators as an indicator of uh, environmental health. Time for the lecture. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be the lecture about pesticides and how what is their impact on bees. We will be talking about the role of bees in the ecosystem. We will be talking about the role of bees in the ecosystem. We will be talking about the role of bees in the ecosystem. Później się zatrzymamy na chwilę na tematy pszczoły. Co rozumiemy no. terminem? What we are talking about. But let's przejdziemy do tematów talk about bardziej bees. delikatnych, czyli What straty rodzin pszczelich do i jaki ma z tym związek kwestia pesticydów, na temat pesticydów, jaki mają wpływ na pszczoły i co ewentualnie możemy zrobić, żeby zredukować do minimum ryzyko szkód. Zaczynamy więc od roli pszczół w rolnictwie i w ekosystemie. Nikt z nas nie ma wątpliwości, że pszczoła jest owadem pożytecznym, szczególnie sektor pszczelarski. About przez pszczoły jest so the procesem of, bardzo ważnym product, dla zarówno roślin, jak i uprawnych. Uh, 88 that, uh, gatunków is brought about by the pollination. 88% of species of wild animals depend on bees and their pollination. So this means that 88% of species would not be able to survive without pollinators, including bees. So the bees are the foundation for biodiversity and this means the stability of ecosystems. 84% of species of farmed plants czyli rolniczych w Unii so Europejskiej totally będziemy mieli żadnego plonu. Otherwise we will have no crop Wartość whatsoever. dla sektora rolniczego the tej, value tej of działalności pszczół the bee activity for agriculture is estimated to reach 22 billion euro annually in the European Union, Union only. You can see a photo of a typical vegetable fruit department in a classic supermarket. Next photo. What would be the situation in a hypothetical world without the bees, without pollinators? We would have very few uh, fruits. Here we can see Tangerines that do not require pollination and are not grown in Poland, and very, very few vegetables. So our diet would be very poor. Whoever is trying to analyze the impact of bees and the losses in agriculture caused by the losses of bee populations frequently argue that 75% of the mass of the food consumed by the planet does not require pollinators to crop. This is true. Right? Corn, wheat and other cereals do not require pollinators to crop because they are pollinated by the wind. However, we have to remember that even if these foodstuffs are the foundation of our diet because they provide us with energy, but they do not provide us with uh, vitamins. This is just starch and carbohydrates. This is the main uh, composition of uh, 
cereals, but in order to have highly nutritive food with a lot of vitamins and other important uh, nutrients, important for us, unfortunately we have to uh, reach for vegetables and fruit that, as we mentioned, do need, the majority of them do need uh, bees to crop. Now, who are we talking about? What do we mean by a bee? When we, mean, when we say a bee, who do we mean? Majority of uh, us uh, know, like an average citizen, know that we have the Apis mellifera, the honeybee. This is a species with a few subspecies in Europe. And when we say the bee, we think of honeybee. But we have to remember that the honeybee is just one species. It's one among species total worldwide. We have 25,000 bee species worldwide. And this number is not complete because we keep discovering new bee species. We have 2,000 bee species in Europe. In Poland itself, we have a bit under 1,000 wild bees species in Poland. Here we can see one flower of one species of a plant. And you can see it's visited by bees belonging to several different species. We can see a honeybee, a bumblebee, and some other wild bees. Let's move on to a sensitive subject, namely the losses of bee families. No doubt that uh, each of us heard about this problem, and uh, this problem has been mentioned in uh, uh, the mass media. People write about it, that the survivability with the bees is questionable, which means survivability of our species. If bees go, we go. And in recent years, we have been witnessing a big drop in the number of populations of both honeybees and wild bees. This photo shows a terrible, dramatic picture, namely a whole carpet of dead bees in front of a row of beehives in an apiary. This is a classic, classic image of intoxication of bees by pesticides. This whole apiary has been intoxicated by foraging on crop that had been sprayed incorrectly. As I said, there's uh, many species of bees and they share the same fate. So, because of wild bees uh, occupy the same ecological niche as the honeybee, so they feed on the precisely same feed, pollen and nectar, this means that they are at the same risk precisely as the honeybee. I'm talking about the risk of intoxication. Frequently, we have to uh, use uh, different uh, practices like um, introducing beehives to our farms, to our fields, because agriculture ecosystem is sterile. It does not have enough pollinators and the crop would be very, very low without introducing migrating beehives uh, in the flowering season. This is a rather extreme situation that we can observe in California in the USA. California is a state that produces almonds and the majority of almonds produced in our planet, on our planet, comes from California indeed. So that's the basic uh, crop of that state. And when uh, almond trees flower, hundreds of thousands of beehives are brought over there on trucks in order to make sure that uh, uh, almond trees fruit. So the question is, what about naturally occurring bees over there? Why can't they pollinate enough in order to for the trees uh, to produce crop? Let's have a look at what is uh, the agriculture landscape in Europe. That's an example of a, a satellite photo from Italy and in the USA. On the next slide, we can see a zoom in to the agriculture landscape in Europe. Small fields, frequently very irregular, frequently adapted to the uh, to the landscape, to the shape of the terrain. You have different creeks, some roads, usually 
some uh, stripes of uh, green plants, maybe a tree, so maybe a small pond. And small pond means the opportunity to have a bit of land that is not uh, covered with agriculture crops. There are some wild uh, plants, usually there's houses with some gardens and so on. So even on this photo, like here, where you have uh, the field tilled, prepared for an annual crop without um, any good offer for the pollinators, still the fragments of wild plants, uh, wild green, along the roads and by houses, homesteads, are a source of uh, forage for honeybees and are also a place where other beneficial insects can thrive, can survive. This is, uh, on the other hand, uh, agricultural landscape in California where almonds are grown. And uh, please note, what it looks like. There is not a single plant that is out of its place. So, growing almonds consists in having almonds. There's no wild plants. There's no other trees along roads or roots or paths. There's nothing besides almonds. What is the result of it? For a majority of the year, for besides two, three weeks of flowering of almonds, this is the environment with no resources, no forage for pollinators. So an easy conclusion is that naturally there are no bees whatsoever because they cannot survive, no matter if we're talking about honeybees or wild bees. Moreover, this is a perfect uh, environment for the development of pathogens and all the pests, all the also pest insects, which means that we need to run intensive phytosanitary uh, procedures which are incompatible with the presence of bees. You see how the problem in the decrease in number of bees is well, workforce is cheap, and you can send to the field pollinators, entire um, troops of manual pollinators. They have their brushes, and this ensures production. Slide 24 shows how other countries ha help themselves. They focus on the development of new technologies. This is, for example, the microdrone project, and it's going to replace bees. They will be let over the fields. They will be automatically looking for flowers to pollinate them. Well, um, all those ideas are interesting, but they don't solve the problem. They don't solve the problem because they all have a basic idea, okay, there are no bees, tough luck, we'll do something. Here in Europe, we're not thinking along these lines, and all we're trying to do is to focus on analyzing the problem, learning the reasons, and removing the reasons, and focusing on what to do so that bees survive. And now my institute is focusing on that. Let's now analyze the problem of pesticides, how they act, what is their impact on bees. Pesticides are substances used in agriculture to kill off the unwanted organisms. They can be uh, herbs, and then these are herbicides. These can be pathogens, mostly um, fungi, then it's fungicides, but that those can also be insects, and these are destroyed by insecticides. These are most dangerous for bees because bees are also insects, for which reason it's very often so that insecticides that are expected to fight some pest insects will be harmful for bees as well. There are two phases. First is exposition. For some substance to harm a bee, a bee must get in touch with that substance. Even if it is highly toxic, but a bee can't 
contact it won't harm a bee at all. That's called exposition, and usually that exposition is caused by some pesticide application. Now, there must be bee toxicity. If a bee has been um, exposed to a pesticide that doesn't harm, we don't see any results. It must be toxic for the bee. Let's now for a moment focus on the first um, phase, exposition. What are the roots of exposition? First, the collector bees are those which are most exposed because they are the ones that spend a lot of their lives outside the hive and there they encounter this risk. They can be um, in contact exposition during a flight when they fall into a pesticide cloud which is used for um, removal of um, insects. After that, the vegetative area is covered and a bee must walk on that surface. It can be uh, poisoned by contact. There's also exposition through food. Why? During a phytosanitary procedure, we also uh, sprayed the flowers. For example, it was the blossoming phase and that substance now is also in nectar and in the pollen. Now the um, bees that go to collect that nectar and pollen are in danger of uh, becoming poisoned. Now it's not only during the um, blossoming. This one is definitely not in bloom, but the bottom of it is covered with wild vegetation. There are plenty of wild flowers. In this case, there was um, this um, insecticide spraying, and there are plenty of wild flowers. If they did it with an insecticide, that was an illegal procedure. Then exposition through food may not only be caused by the substance that landed on the flowers. The picture on the right shows that bees sometimes collect dew or the first drops of rain, especially during drought from the leaves when they don't have water in the hive and if that surface of the leaves at that time is toxic due to some phytosanitary practice the dew of the raindrops will also contain the toxic substance taken to uh, taken home they can intoxicate the whole hive well there are also problems with honeydew. There are many um, plants that offer you that. If you have insecticide on honeydew, that honeydew becomes poisonous. It's obvious that not only the collective bees risk, they take food to the hive and they share it with those which do not do their collecting. So those uh, in the hive would work on that material and they are also exposed just like the brood that at the older uh, stages of development is fed on honey as well. And finally, there is also chronic exposition. If the bees collected slightly um, poisoned or slightly polluted material, they, because for example that was produced by a plant that was never um, sprayed, but for example there were neonicotinoids in the seeds. Such seeds offer us um, plants that immediately through roots 
uh, take that nicotinoid and there are little amounts of it throughout the mm, plant. The amounts are so low that later when it produces nectar and pollen there are trace amounts of this nicotinoid. But if bees collect a lot of it and gather it in the hive, and then there is a period of when they have to use, to consume that for a longer time, then this chronic exposition can finally cause um, increased toxicity and those bees can be harmed by the nicotinoid. That was exposition. Now, how do pesticides work? First effect, most classical and banal, is toxicity. We find dead uh, bees in front of the hive in larger numbers than normally. That's the first um, symptom. It shows this poisoning, a death of some of part of our collection means weakening of it because we've lost usually the collectors, but not only. If this process goes on and we go beyond a certain threshold and we can lose the whole uh, colony because there is a certain level beyond which the colony won't be able to survive. Toxicity, now it's LD50. What's LD50? It's toxicity marker, which says how much of a given substance is necessary to kill an organism. For example, in case of B toxicity, LD50 means how many micrograms of a given insecticide must I give to a single uh, bee to be 50% sure that I've killed that bee? The lower the number, the more toxic the substance, because you need more of that, less of that substance to kill the bee. We all remember DDT, the first synthetic insecticide, which was in use all around the world since 1930, 1976 banned in Europe, and later also in the US, because it quickly turned out that using DDT without any uh, limit, whole system, ecosystems were laid bare. There was no problem first with the um, pests, but then bees and other insects were also killed, as well as birds. That insecticide, DDT, has its LD50 at the level of 27. And this means that you need 27 mic micrograms to kill a bee. And now I'm going to show you some insecticides that are used today, modern ones, that have been entered into the registry, used in European countries for crop protection. Right shows their toxicity compared to DDT. For example, adamectin, which is used regularly, at least in Italy. I work in Italy, so I can speak of Italy. It's 27,000 times more poisonous for um, bees than DDT. And then you have some spinneret, which is used in organic farming, is 6,000 times more uh, toxic. Red marks those which are believed to be highly toxic for bees, those whose LD50 is below one microgram. Why do I mention that? Well, to make you realize that modern insecticides are very, very toxic. True, you use far less of them per hectare, but in case of any mistake by the farmer, the risk of environmental damage is huge. That was about toxicity. If an insecticide is given to a bee, if a bee is exposed to it in amounts far, far below LD50, there is no risk of death, but many insecticides have sublethal effects. What does that mean? 
the bee will be alive, but functionally it will be useless. For example, it has motion uh, problems, can't fly, can't move, it's not coordinating, or like on the right hand side, like this queen, is deformed coming out of its cell. Another problem is the problem with thermal regulation. Many insecticides in sublethal uh, amounts, so below the level of toxicity, cause the loss of B uh, capacity of thermal regulation. Uh, you need 44, 45 degrees uh, inside the hive to keep the brood uh, growing. If they, by mistake, reduce the temperature by three uh, degrees, we lose the following generation because the brood can't develop in a lower temperature. In this photograph, in these photographs, we see an interesting experiment with bee orientation. We can see some microchips attached to bees. On the right-hand side, on the bottom, there are microchip scanners at the door to the hive. The bees with those microchips are later subjected to something. We see that there is syrup uh, poisoned with something. It's one of the nicotinoids. It doesn't matter which, of course, in sublethal amounts. And these birds were let out one kilometer away from the hive, and the computer was reading how many of those returned to the hive which did not return. That experiment is repeated hundreds of times, and it turned out that bees that received neonicotinoids find it difficult to return to the hive. Later, we also have other sublethal effects, lack of care for brood and queen, loss of memory, shorter life, and problems with flight activity. Uh, bees know how to fly, but don't feel like flying. Let's remember, mm, bees, at least the honeybee, is a social animal. If, for example, a very positive insect, like, let's say, a uh, mm, uh, ladybird does not use its functions for a day, because this usually lasts a short time. Bees normally treated with such insecticide will be back. If, uh, mm, if a ladybird is treated with that, well, it just didn't eat as many mice as it would normally. After a day, it's back to its normal rules. It can still uh, eat more of those. If, if in a hive, one of the groups stops working in a hive, for example, the feeders, the ones that are supposed to maintain the temperature, this one day can be lethal for the whole uh, family. And then we also talking about synergy. Synergy is caused by uh, synergy is comes from different factors. When we have more negative factors, if we have them coming together at such a level that with one of them not causing any negative effects, when the both of them come together, we can see multiplication of reinforcement of such harmful and negative behavior. For example, uh, bad weather conditions, bad uh, pollen, poor health, presence of pathogens in the uh, colony, else some other substances that pollute the environment. If some of these comorbidities, we could say, is combined with slight sublethal poisoning of the colony in our hive, we can expect major losses. Let's now see what the symptoms are. How can we 
guess that they die due to poisoning, not an illness. First, dead bees in front of the hive. We always see them there because bees die every day for natural reasons. Their lifespan is limited, so sometimes up to 1,500 of bees die a day. But if suddenly we see an abnormal number of dead bees in front of the hive, that's the first symptom of poisoning. If we then uh, have laboratory uh, tests and there are pesticides in their bodies, that corroborates it. N untypical behavior, loss of orientation, tremors, trying to enter the hive from the other end, problems with flight or abnormal aggressiveness, either lacking or excessive. All these can be suggestions for us that the bee is poisoned. As we see also mm, vomiting uh, the content of their stomach, another symptom at the level of a hive is the lack of brood. If a family is in good condition but we see no brood, this means that there has been a pesticide um, poisoning from IGL group that is the one that attacks primarily the pupa. Of course, sometimes there are empty hives, especially in our region. We open a hive and there's nobody in, small group of bees and there are no other bees. Okay, what to do about the pesticides? I will give you a few hints about what we can do to reduce the risk, to mitigate the risk. Agriculture, what should agriculture do? Well, agriculture should focus on the proper application of pesticides, namely following the labels. If a pesticide is harmful or potentially harmful for the bees, it will be stated so on the label. It will be stated, the label will state that you cannot apply it uh, in the presence of wind, flowers, honeydew. Wind, because uh, the working substance can get moved by the wind to other crops or wild plants, poisoning them. If possible, use it in the evening and definitely not when the bees are active. What uh, should farmers do? They should uh, mow down or cut down wild flowers in orchards before spraying. Farmers should notify beekeepers about their intention to spray, so the cooperation is very important. Now, what is the direction now? We should be trying to use pesticides that are, of, uh, that are not very toxic for the bees, so low toxicity for the bees, and the data about toxicity for the bees, namely the LD50 values, can be found very easily in the internet. There are international databases where the data can be found easily. So, before spraying, it is enough to check the toxicity of a pesticide for the bees. Of course, we should be using pesticides only when it's absolutely necessary, and based on our studies, we see that in many cases, majority of cases, or in many cases, actually, majority of cases, uh, these sprays are performed uh, unnecessarily or excessively, and of course, let's promote biologicals for crop protection. What can beekeepers do? Attention, attention. First of all, make sure that the colonies are healthy. The colonies should be as strong as possible because then they can cope better with any potential intoxication. So, education and uh, re sorry, reducing potential synergistic effects. So make sure that uh, the forage is of high quality, reduce the load of diseases, reduce the burden uh, of parasites, maintain the good health of the colonies. As a result, a good, strong, healthy colony, in case of some slight intoxication, has higher chance to survive. Use good genetic material, that uh, uh, means appropriate hygienic behaviors of the bees, because this is uh, related to the first point, namely maintaining uh, good health of the colonies. We have to make sure that we loc locate our apiary in a proper area in respect to agriculture crops. If we have uh, agriculture crops that are not compatible with the bees, we should move away from them, because some crops are quite friendly for the bees. 
If we have intoxicated co intoxicated colony, in order to avoid the chronic exposure, it is worth to remove all resources and immediately feed them with clean extra feed, pollen, sugar, protein substitute, whatever. And if needed, support them by other bees, support the colony by other bees. The most dangerous class of pesticides are insecticides, but we cannot ignore fungicides and herbicides either, because based on most recent studies, we can see that these substances can also be very, very harmful for the bees by having synergistic subletal effect, even if directly they are not toxic for the bees. Here you can see a few photos regarding what a farmer, sorry, a beekeeper do to guarantee a proper quality of forage, even in difficult times for the bees when nothing is uh, uh, flowering. In some countries, it is very, very popular to sow special mixes of uh, wild plants on the edges of fields or out of apiary. Well, what can a consumer do? What an average citizen can do? First and foremost, they can buy products uh, in the shop that have a reduced impact on the environment, preferably organic farming products. And uh, I personally am an optimist, I am positive, because in the EU, organic farming, uh, organic farming is uh, growing dynamically. There's more and more farms that uh, are focusing on organic production. Consumers are also more and more sensitive to environmental questions. I'm not sure about the situation in Poland, but in Italy, we have had uh, we different campaigns in the media focusing on making consumers more sensitive to environmental issues. So organic products are <clears throat> preferred by consumers more and more. Finally, new EU law that is uh, not in force yet, sadly, but it is ready or almost ready regarding registration of pesticides. Earlier, before, in order to register a pesticide, then uh, only regarding its uh, harm for the bees, what was tested was only the harm for adult bees and if there's any acute toxicity. According to new guidelines, now you will have to test the impact on honeybee, bumblebees, um, mason bees, and other lonely bees, loner bees. So you also look at the um, you also look at the effect not only on adult bees but also larvae. Also, you have to test different types of exposure, not only the risk related to the spraying of the flowers, but also the possibility of the presence of flowering weeds in a crop, or flowering weeds on the edges of the field, or flowering crops in the neighborhood. As a result, the majority of pesticides that you have seen in that chart that are highlighted red will not be registered anymore. Thank you very much. Bardzo dziękujemy za ten niezwykle interesujący. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Thank you very much, Piotr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a few questions. Because we had uh, some uh, problems with internet connectivity, we had to give up uh, on uh, video, but audio was good. So I do hope we can still maintain the audio connection. So let's move on to questions because there are a few interesting questions. Can I? Can we hear each other? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear very well. Great. Okay. All right. Without further ado, let's move to questions. In order to reduce the population of uh, uh, different insects that are harmful for the bees, different biologicals have been. Uh, uh, prepared. To what extent this is efficient? Nowadays, you can grow different crops using biologicals. Majority of crops can be grown using biologicals. That's my opinion. And that's the future of the agriculture, ag agriculture in Europe and worldwide. Maybe not in three years, but five to ten. So the future is pesticide-free uh, agriculture. I know a lot of people would, would want to kill me now, but I'm far away, luckily. Thank you very much for your answer. 
Another question. Why in Asia people are pollinating instead of, for instance, bringing bees, migrating beehives, like in California? A very good question. That was, California was an example. In the majority, in many Asian countries, as we know, the labor cost is zero. So this is a way to use people who are there and can be used. And they do not cost a lot. This is a very, very sad situation, but this is the brutal truth. And the problem is not that people are used, but the problem is that people do not think about the bees. On the other hand, using manpower to pollinate um, as a result of using manpower to pollinate, a farmer can completely ignore the problem of uh, intoxicating environment and the insects during um, uh, uh, with things that kill the insects and pollinators. Because if I kill all the pollinators, no problem. I have people to pollinate. Uh, my crops, that's obvious. Well, yes, this is a big problem. Thank you very much for the answer. Let's have another question, a last one. Some national parks do not allow to have apiaries in them because honeybees are said to be too strong a competition for natural pollinators. What do you think? Uh, speaking of competition, yesterday we had uh, this discussion during the panel. Someone mentioned uh, the uh, competition between the pollinators. We can talk about competition in case of a very high pressure of the honeybee in an ecosystem. I believe in the case of national parks, the problem is different. This is a problem of the risk of uh, contaminating local native subspecies of bees with uncontrolled genes. Because, uh, well, let's be honest, in contemporary times, there's very few apiaries who breed native local bees. Uh, I'm not sure about Poland, because for 25 years I have been working in Chile. This is why apologies for any glitches in my Polish. So I believe that national parks can be worried about this. Namely, they may be worried about uh, diluting the genetic pool of uh, native bees local for the park with the non-native subspecies. Because speaking of competition, I guess the solution would be to maybe set up a limit for um, number of bee colonies within the park or near the park. But if we're talking about the competition, yes, it happens, but in case of very, very high density, that's my opinion. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your precious comments. Yes, uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your presentation, which was very interesting. Thank you for being with us uh, during uh, this uh, conference, during BCAM 2021. Thank you very much indeed. And we do hope to be able to uh, exchange opinions and listen to your interesting presentations again. Thank you very much. Thank you very again for the patience and thank you for having me.